Welcome back. In today's lecture, we're going to talk about the general case of Gaussian elimination. So remember what we've done so far is cases where you can solve the system by multiplying on the left by a strictly lower triangular matrix in order to make the system upper triangular. And this example right here is sort of the prototypical example of a case where that doesn't work. If you tried to do that here, you would try and add a multiple of 0 to 1 to make the 1 equal to 0, but you, that obviously doesn't work. So there's no way to add a multiple of the first row to the second in order to make this term 0. So, well, that's kind of silly if you ask me. This is an extremely easy system to solve if you write it out. The first equation just simply says y is equal to 2, and the second equation is that x is equal to 1. Well, you're done. So, um, there's nothing really wrong with this. It just requires a, a new uh, technique, and that technique is simply the one of pivoting, which is, in this example, you, rather than trying to do a combination of rows, you simply switch the two rows. And if you switch the two rows of this matrix, you get the matrix 1, 0, 0, 1. You leave the x, y, and you switch the two rows of this matrix to get 1, 2. And, well, there we are. That's um, x equals 1 and y is equal to 2. Okay, so now just a little bit of terminology. Uh, when you have a matrix such as this, and you apply uh, row and column operations to it to make it upper triangular, uh, you, you multiply the first row by minus 2 and add it to the second row in order to make this 2 into a 0. And what you did is you used this 1, and this 1 is called the pivot. And having a pivot means that you can add multiples of that number to any of the numbers below it in that column to make them 0. The problem with this matrix is that the pivot was 0. And as I said, you can't use a 0 to affect any of the other entries below it. Okay, let's look at another example. Suppose this was the coefficient matrix of a system of equations which we were trying to solve, and we tried to use the method of Gaussian elimination uh, here, and you should pretend that this is part of a system xyz is equal to some vector and um, you're solving that system, but the main point is the operations that you're doing to this matrix. So the first thing you'll do, of course, is you will um, multiply the first row by minus 1 and add it to the second row, which will give you 1, 2, 1, 0, 0, minus 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay? And now you're done with the first row because you have a 1, 0, 0, and the second row you have 2, 0, 1, and now you're into the pivot situation again because um, the 2 you don't need to touch but you'd like to uh, get rid of this 1, but the only way that you could do that would be to multiply, would be to use this pivot right here, and that pivot is 0. So what you need to do in this instance is interchange the second uh, two rows, which brings you to the matrix 1, 2, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And now you're done. This is in upper triangular form, and you could go ahead and solve uh, whatever system you had. Okay, so let's uh, pause here for a moment and uh, look ahead and see what the end point is here. Uh, suppose we have a system, and we perform a series of operations to it, and we turn it into a, an upper triangular system. So here's a fairly general upper triangular 3x3 three three system. Uh, what I've indicated is that we have uh, our coefficient matrix here, and uh, our variables x, y, z, and then r, s, t are any numbers. 
And the main point here is this matrix is upper triangular, so it has zeros below the diagonal. And um, the question is, does this uh, system have a solution, and can we find it easily? And as long as the key point is, as long as a, b, and c are non-zero, uh, the answer is yes. We can solve this by the method of back substitution. And I'll just remind you, the way that works is the very last equation says that uh, CZ is equal to T. And we can say that um, Z is equal to T over C. And for that, it's extremely helpful to know that C is not equal to zero. And at the next step, we're going to do something similar. We're going to want to know, we're going to want to divide by B, so we're going to want to know that B is not equal to zero. And similarly, A is not equal to zero. Okay, so let's look a little more carefully at this operation of switching rows. So, for example, if you have a two by two matrix, what is the operation which uh, switches the first and second row? So I want to multiply on the left such that the first two rows, these two rows get switched. And if you think about it for a second, you'll see it's exactly this matrix 0, 1, 1, 0, because when you do this multiplication, you get C, D, A, B. Okay, so a permutation matrix in general A permutation matrix is one which has this effect. It switches the um, it switches the rows around, and by definition, a permutation matrix is just one with a, a single one in each row and column. And the key fact. is that if P is a permutation matrix, then uh, P times A, uh, what that is, is, is it's the same matrix as A uh, with the rows permuted. And exactly how they're permuted depends on the permutation matrix. So let's look at this permutation matrix, for example. This has a single one in each column and a single one in each row. So that says it's permutation matrix. And what's its effect? Well, when you multiply this first row by these three columns, you pick up the last row. And when you multiply this row, you pick up the first row. And then finally, this row gives you the second row. And so what permutation was this? It sent the first row to the last. It sent the last, excuse me, that's incorrect. Um, what it did was uh, it sent the first row, 2, 1, 3, into the second position. It sent the second row, 4, 6, 0, into the third position. And it sent the last one up. So it's the cyclic permutation one, two, three, back to one again. It's called a cyclic permutation because it cyclically permutes all three rows. So a permutation matrix doesn't necessarily switch two rows. It's allowed to permute the rows in various more complicated ways. Uh, so, for example, um, I'll pose a question now. Um, question. Um, how many uh, 
how many 3 by 3 permutation matrices are there? And if you uh, are able to answer that, you should, might even want to think about the general case. How many n by n permutation matrices are there? And I suggest you pause the presentation for a moment and uh, work this out. Um, let's write down the 2 by 2. How many 2 by 2 permutation mark matrices are there? Well, there, the answer is 2, because there's 1, 1. And there's 0, 1, 1, 0. So uh, why don't you pause the presentation and s at least see if you can figure out how many 3 by 3 there are. Very good. Welcome back. Uh, I hope that you saw that there are, in fact, 6 3 by 3 permutation matrices. And maybe you even figured out that there are n factorial uh, n by n permutation matrices. n factorial, of course, is the number n times n minus 1 down to 1. And one way to see that is if you are making a matrix, you have to put a 1 in the first column somewhere. And there are n places you can put it. And now that you put a 1 in the first column somewhere, you have to put a 1 in the second column somewhere, and there are n minus 1 places you can put it, because you can put it in n places except for the one place which you've already taken. And the next time the number of choices is n minus 2, and by, you get, by the time you get to the last column, there will be a unique choice. And if you multiply all of those numbers together, that gives you n factorial. OK, here's a very basic fact about permutation matrices. Uh, suppose you have a bunch of permutation matrices, uh, P1 through PR. These are n by n permutation matrices. All of, that is, they're all of the same size. And you multiply them all together, then the result is also a permutation matrix. That's actually kind of neat. So for example, this is a permutation matrix. This is P1. And if you multiply it by this permutation matrix, P2, you get another permutation matrix. There's exactly one one in each row in each column of this resulting matrix. And why is that? Well, it's really quite simple. Uh, if you think about applying these on the left to some matrix, this matrix permutes the rows in some order. And then this matrix permutes the rows in some order. So if you do one and then the other, then you're permuting the rows in some third order. And that permutation is exactly the resulting permutation matrix. So that's a, a key fact. Uh, it's important to keep in mind that when you multiply permutation matrices together, it's, it's closed under that operation. OK, so let's see what it means to use these techniques to solve the general system of linear equations. So suppose we have an equation like this, ax is equal to c, and I've left room here to write some other matrices. Uh, we saw before what we would do is we try and find uh, an elementary matrix, say E1, um, where to multiply both sides of this equation on, and maybe another one E2, and repeatedly do this, and hopefully we'd eventually get uh, to A being an upper triangular matrix, but maybe we hit a zero pivot at some point. So then we have to throw in a permutation matrix in order to fix that. And then maybe some other uh, elementary matrices to keep going. And uh, eventually we hope to wind up with an upper triangular matrix on the left hand side. So the idea is that we have our matrix A and we're going to multiply it by some series of elementary and permutation matrices like this. And eventually, we're hoping that this will make this upper triangular. And now, the permutation matrices are changing the orders of some variables. And 
if you think about it, you see that you could actually do um, do these first. And um, now, if you do that, um, what you'll get, put all of your permutation matrices first. So let's say we rearrange things so that we put all of the permutation matrices first. And now the comment that I made uh, before comes in, a product of a bunch of permutation matrices is a permutation matrix. So I can write all of those as a single permutation P. And uh, what do we know about a product of a bunch of elementary matrices? It's not necessarily elementary, of course, but it is a strictly lower triangular. So um, that's L, and this is P, and so we get the equation L, P, uh, A is equal to U. So this is a more general uh, kind of result than what we had before. Uh, before we were hoping to just use L, but now we're allowing ourselves to use both an L and a P, but we don't have to mix them. We can first use P and then use L. So this leads to the permuted LU factorization, which is a generalization of the ordinary LU factorization, which we've already seen. Uh, given it here in three equivalent forms, we're given a square matrix A, and the form I just gave is this one right here. Um, given the matrix A, we find a permutation matrix P and a um, special lower triangular matrix L, such that L, P, A is equal to U, and this is the form that's most useful for solving simultaneous equations, because um, if you have an equation uh, A, X, Uh, is equal to C, and we multiply both sides of this equation by LP, and LP will go in over here also, what we get is that UX is equal to LPC. Uh, here, this is a uh, um, LPA is equal to U, and now this is an upper triangular system, and I don't care what LPC is, it's some random vector, but this is easy to solve by back substitution. So that's, that's what we've just been discussing, and then these two are obtained uh, from this one just by moving things around. So, uh, for example, to get from here to here, uh, just bring the L to the other side, and to get from here to here, uh, just bring the P to the other side. And this one um, is, in some sense, a very natural one, because here the matrix A that we started with is on the left-hand side, and I've expressed it as a product of a permutation matrix, a lower triangular matrix, and an upper triangular matrix. All right, so let's uh, conclude with uh, an example. Let's consider this system and let's say we were try to try and solve it by this technique. So um, if this is the matrix A, um, what you're going to try and do is find LP such that LPA is equal to U. And I'm going to let you um, do most of that. I will just write down um, what U is, and um, we can talk about the rest of it in class. I believe that uh, if you do the natural thing, U turns out to be it's a bad idea. Uh, so let's conclude with an example. Um, consider this uh, system of equations. This is our matrix A, and uh, we want to find matrices um, L and P such that L, P, A is equal to U. So I suggest you pause the presentation here and work this out for yourself. And I'll give you a moment to do that, and then um, I'll say a few words about that. Okay, welcome back. Um, let's just write down what L, uh, what they are, and we can finish uh, talk about the rest of it in class. So, I believe that what you get is um, L 
looks like this. Uh, and then uh, P is this permutation matrix. And I claim that when you multiply those times A, uh, that what you get is the upper triangular matrix uh, 2, 1, minus 2, 4, 6, 1. So I will let you check that and see if, uh, double check my work and see if that's what you get, and to use this to actually solve this system. See you in class.